Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Siskin here. Um, I'm the author of this book, Playing Solo Jazz Piano. If you're enjoying the videos and you want to support me and keep me going, uh, buy a copy of that book, uh, particularly from my website, and I'll very much appreciate it. Um, today, I want to do a deep dive into arpeggios. Um, two things before we get started on arpeggios, just so that we're all on the same page. The first one is if you're from a classical background, you probably practice arpeggios like this. And that's not what I mean when I am talking about arpeggios um, in this context. What I mean here is that we're going to skip from chord tone to chord tone. So arpeggios are kind of complementary to scales. When you're playing a scale, you step from chord tone to chord tone. And we could do scalar improvisation, which would be very stepwise. Right? Or if we're thinking about arpeggio improvisation, then we're going to be leaping from chord tone to chord tone. Now I know in jazz kind of almost anything could be a chord tone um, because right we have the, our upper extensions, root, third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, not on major dominant chords, and thirteenth. So almost any note of the scale could be part of the arpeggio, but what really is going to define them is that we're skipping. Typically we're going to be skipping in thirds or maybe sometimes fourths between notes of the arpeggio. That's going to be our most typical kind of leap. Why arpeggios? The answer is that they help make the chord and the harmony clear. With scales, um, you know, it's unclear which notes you're emphasizing that are part of the chord because you're kind of step stepping between notes. Um, you might kind of land on one for a little bit. With arpeggios, the fact that you're skipping from chord tone to chord tone is going to make that chord feel really clear and it's going to give it a more dynamic shape because they cover more ground more quickly than scales. So before I launch into, I have kind of three big categories of how you can practice these arpeggios. Um, I wanted to just show you what I think is one of the great all-time jazz solos that uses a ton of arpeggios, um, so you know that I'm not making anything up. So uh, this is Louis Armstrong's solo on Potato Head Blues. Um, and the chords are kind of my best guesses. Uh, this solo is in stop time, meaning that there's just kind of one chord uh, for every two measures. So sometimes it sounds like he's implying a chord and I ended up writing those chords in parentheses. Um, but let's just listen for it. And what you're listening for here is his use of arpeggio. So here we go. One, two, three, four, one. on from there. I don't know what that little line is doing there. Sorry about that. So let's just look and you know we could certainly debate about what exactly to call an arpeggio and what not to call an arpeggio. So let's start with some examples that to me are clearly arpeggios. This very last phrase which is one of the hippest phrases I think ever played. It's just a triad arpeggio right? He's playing the fifth, the third, the root, the fifth, the third, the root. Um, of the triad arpeggio. And it's actually kind of interesting as you study this solo, uh, he ends on the sixth, which he does that same thing a few other times. And the, the fifth and the sixth are often interchangeable. So going from the very last thing he plays to the very first thing he plays, we can look and see that same exact pattern, right? He's doing just the triad arpeggio with some repeated notes here. Root three, five root, and then he ends on the sixth. So it's kind of like he's limiting himself to the triad and then adding a little color at the end. Measure six, here's another spot where I think we can clearly say it's an arpeggio, right? He's just going up and down the root, third, fifth, seventh, fifth, third, root, and then to the sharp five. And we could actually see that this is kind of analogous to adding the six at the end, right? He's adding the most colorful note after he's kind of played the most basic arpeggio. I think we'd be probably correct in calling these next two measures an arpeggio. Um, here, he's using the sixth in place of the fifth. So he's playing the sixth, the third, the sixth, the root, uh, the third, the sixth, the third. So 
though certainly it wouldn't be hard to look at that and see a G minor triad um, just being outlined. Um, this next spot below it is pretty interesting because here he's playing a dominant seventh chord and he's actually using the dominant seventh. And then he plays a half step away and comes back. And we're going to be talking a little bit about um, kind of ornamenting arpeggios with notes a half step away. Um, here's another interesting one at 18. I mean, we could call almost everything here an arpeggio. So he's going from the sixth to the fifth to the third, the sixth, the root, the third, the fifth. Right, below it again, he doesn't have the root in this arpeggio, but he's doing kind of a similar thing that he adds the sharp five right at the end there, right? So here's the third, the seventh, the fifth, the third, the seventh, the seventh, the seventh, the seventh, and then that sharp fifth. Again, adding the color at the end. And I love this moment here where he goes down one arpeggio and then up another. Okay. Um, so I just love that solo. I think it's such a great example. But, you know, if you look at Donnelly, greatest example of bebop, or, you know, one of the quintessential examples of bebop, we'll also find all these moments of really clear arpeggios. So it's not just Louis Armstrong doing this. Um, it's not just an old style. We have all of these arpeggios in Donnelly. Right, just outlining an F7 chord. We're going to talk about the 3, 5, 7, 9 uh, hand position later, and that's exactly what he's doing here. Here's a long arpeggio. Right? He goes up from the root and arpeggios all the way up to the 11th. 3, 5, 7, 9 again. 3, 5, 7, 9 again. Okay, so hopefully I've made my point there. Um, I will not belabor it further. Um, so let's look at some ways that you can practice arpeggios. So the first thing that I recommend, you know, in the spirit of Louis Armstrong, is to see, you know, if you put on a timer for two minutes, could you improvise using just the triad of one chord? Using rhythm, leaping, repetition, um, maybe some uh, changes of direction, creating kind of an interesting shape. So if I'm staying just on C major seven, definitely limiting don't get me wrong it's only three notes um, but man that's a great place to start to force you to focus on those elements of rhythm and to get you you know maybe out of your scalar thinking but your next step already makes it more interesting which is to do the triad plus half step lead-ins we talked about that moment where Louis Armstrong took this C natural and stretched it up to that D flat and you can practice that same thing again Staying on one chord for the time being, we're going to expand soon, um, but doing half step lead-ins, usually it's more common to lead in from below, but just like Louis Armstrong, we can also put a half step above the note. So let's start below. squeeze them out like a lemon. Um, and then you can try those half steps above, which in some cases are going to be more colorful. And then 
of course you can mix some from below, some from above. into the note of the arpeggio. You can't just be going and only playing the notes above, right? <laughs> or, you know, going from the note of the arpeggio to the dissonant note. You always have to resolve into that note of the arpeggio. Um, so that's a very different way to create than thinking about a scale. Um, and I think it's very healthy, and I know a lot of improvisers who could really use that kind of practice and that kind of reinforcement to orient yourself towards those notes of the chords. Of course, like everything in jazz, we want to practice this on two, five, one progressions. Um, and here, I have a couple of hand positions that I would suggest starting with. Um, and I'm going to blow up that iPad for you. Oh, you can see behind the scenes here. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, okay, so here's one really important hand position. I told you we talk about the three, five, seven, nine arpeggio. And so in this hand position, you know what, I'm gonna to go to a different screen so you can still see my hands. There you go, you can read everything. So, if I'm doing it in C, here's a D minor seven. I'm using the three, five, seven, nine, F, A, C, and E. And then to go to seven, nine, three, thirteen, all I have to do is actually take this C, swivel that down here. And then to get to the C, these two are gonna stay the same. These outside notes are gonna move. So it's minimal movement here. Okay. And I don't mean to limit you in any way, um, but this is just a good place to start in terms of finding hand positions that, that really work. Um, and the reason that I've chosen this hand position is that the bottom notes form this three, seven, three guide tone line that's so important to tonal harmony. We really wanna hear that. So having that on the bottom is going to help to kind of reinforce the harmony. It's also lovely because it makes the third come like right against the chord. If you start on the downbeat, and I'm going to show you how to kind of expand off of these hand positions in just a second. But first I want to show you the other hand position. Wish me luck with technology. Come on, baby. All right, good enough. So um, here, of course, we're starting with the two chord, then the five, then the one. So on the two chord, I would have the seventh, the ninth, the third, and the fifth. And then again, here, the only thing that's going to move is the seventh is going to move down to the third. And then it's actually the opposite. Here, the outsides are going to stay the same. These guys are going to slide down. So again, this has seven and third, seventh and third on the bottom, which makes it a really great place to start. There's your first hand position, there's your second hand position. So these hand positions, I'm not going to lie, they are limiting. Um, and I'm going to see if I can go back to my other view here. Well, so when you're dealing with them, this is going smoothly, right? One of the things that I would do is I would add crossovers. So if you're here in this first hand position, one thing you can do So I'm keeping my thumb anchored where, uh, where it was on the F, F, E, but then I'm crossing over with my two, or I could even cross over with my two and three. to more notes without necessarily quote unquote changing hand positions. Obviously you are kind of changing hand positions, but that thumb is acting as the stable point. Um, 
other things that you can do with these hand positions, you know, first of all, I feel like whenever I tell students to use hand positions, they're trying to use all of the notes in a hand position. Um, and certainly that's not advisable. Um, so. for each hand position. Um, and then your fourth finger is really acting as the free agent here. Um, in this hand position, the D sharp is a really nice place for it to be. You know, and then it can move down to the C sharp on the C major. Um, in this hand position, the G sharp is a really nice place for it to be. And then I like going up and then down. Or the opposite. Um, plus, it's great to swivel between these two hand positions. So check this out. I'm going to go from here to there. some variety in there. So I'm not saying you want to stay stationary all the time, but these are two really good hand positions to get yourself oriented to really define the chord via arpeggios. And of course, as with just about anything, we want to add altered tones to our dominant chords. So not just, but, you know, a flat nine and a flat 13, or, sharp five. Right, so experiment with different altered tones for the dominant chord within those hand positions. Okay, and the last thing um, for now is my challenge to you, which is to try to improvise a whole solo using maybe first only arpeggios, and then second only arpeggios plus half step lead. -ins. Again, this is the antidote to scale-wise thinking. Here, we're thinking more about leaps. So let's take uh, the simple tune, Tuna. Just basically a series of two five ones. And here, I'm gonna improvise a solo using only arpeggios, and I'm gonna try to make it sound as good as possible. So. using only arpeggios. And now I'm gonna try using only arpeggios plus the half step lead in. So kind of bringing it back to the first thing that I showed you. So.
how much music you can make, even within these limitations. Well, thank you so much for uh, listening to me talk about arpeggios, a subject that I'm very passionate about. Uh, reminder, I'll very gladly send you a signed copy of this book if you order it from my website. And if you stuck around, around uh, this long, then uh, the, the keyword is golden papaya. So mention golden papaya in the comments, and uh, I will know that you're a true, true believer and you stuck around all the way to the end. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great one.